there's a link between disease development and the number of stem cells in circulation. The intestinal flora in the gut is the culprit. Three weeks later, I get an email. For the first time, her daughter stood up. This quadriplegic with no mobility below the waist. After about four or five months, he starts to have movement in his leg. Hydrogen is at the center of everything. It is the universal antioxidant. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited. I know I know you're a, a stem cell expert uh, pioneer. Maybe we can we can talk a little bit about who you are. Give us an introduction of kind of your past. What got you here? You know, because I'm sure you didn't start in the stem cell research area, right? Yeah, nobody in the world of stem cells started in stem cells. It's just too new of a thing. And I think this is one thing for any you know for your listeners to kind of understand. This is an extremely new science extremely prolific, like I've never seen anything else. But my starting point was uh, neurophysiology, brain research. So I was doing uh, research at the Montreal Neurological Institute on essentially epilepsy and memory. Uh, I was hired by a company uh, in 1995, a company that was selling a dietary supplement, which you may have heard of, uh, Blue Green Algae from Klamath Lake, also known as AFA. So my, my task was to document how this Blue Green Algae was working in the body. Uh, we very quickly identified a number of active compounds uh, to support its anti-inflammatory benefits, its benefits on the mind. Uh, many people report some sort of a mood elevation effect and its effect on immunity. But as I'm doing all of this, I come across people who reported benefits on multiple sclerosis, kidney failure, liver failure, heart disease, uh, arteriosclerosis, Parkinson, Alzheimer's, emphysema. And the question was, how can one plant do so many different things in people? So we can get into more of the detail if you want, but to make this story short, uh, at some point the thought was, what if that plant act as a stem cell mobilizer? We're in 2001, this is just an emerging science. And we bought the equipment to count stem cells and we very quickly discovered that this product was a stem cell mobilizer. And, uh, and then I just became fascinated with everything stem cells. I've been doing stem cell research now for 20, what, 22 years. Wow, that's crazy. Just by that introduction alone, I have a million questions for you. I, I'm blown away that stem cells have been around that long. You know, I remember when they, what was it that, uh, was it a sheep or a goat, right, that they cloned? And, and that was probably in the mid 90s. And that was the first time I really heard of this stuff. And I got excited. You know, I'm a guy, I'm, a, I'm in my, I'm, I'm pushing 50, right? And I'm thinking to myself, how can I live forever? So, you know, maybe that'll happen, right? To go back a little bit in your career, you know, I, I find algae extremely interesting. I take a lot of spir spirulina algae, right? Which I think is like out of Hawaii or, or whatnot. Can you talk a little bit of how that relates to blue green algae or is it something similar or what, what are the benefits of, of these two types of products? You have about three to 5,000 species of blue green algae. Of all of those so far documented, three of them are edible. Nostoc, spirulina, in that blue green algae from Klamath Lake, which is called Aphanizom and Onflus Aqua, in short AFA. They look very different, but they're all blue green algae, meaning they don't have a nucleus and they, they produce phycocyanin, which is a blue pigment called phycocyanin, which is sort of a, a light capturing compound and a nitrogen uh, storing mechanism in those cells. So that's what it is. It's, it's believed to be the first form of life on the planet. Spirulina and AFA are fairly similar when we look at their general composition, but AFA, the reason why I got so interested in that species is that first it was it is the only species that I know of that produces phenylethylamine, which is a compound known in chemistry as the molecule of love, whenever, or the molecule of joy. Whenever you do something that is taking all your, your presence, if you want, your painting, your sculpting, uh, your financial problems will come back tomorrow. You don't have to worry about it. But right now, you're just content with what you're doing. Your brain is making PEA. Uh, AFA is a natural source of PA, and that's why many people were using it because it gave them this sense of sort of well-being, mood elevation, concentration, mental energy. But what we discovered is that effect on stem cells. We did test on spirulina because it would be a much cheaper source of raw ingredient to be able to do a stem cell, uh, a stem cell enhancer, but we did not find that, that effect in spirulina. So they are pretty much the same, but you get with AFA the effect on stem cells and the effect on the brain. Other than this, spirulina is an amazing food source, no question. So other than getting me high, what's the benefit of this? Well, 
It's not really a high. When you take it, it's very subtle as an effect. Many people would describe it by saying, let's say you get a mom uh, dealing with the kids, and when she puts the kid at, you know, at bed at night, she just wants to herself crash in bed, tired. And mothers would tell me, well, now when I put the kids in bed, I just feel like I want to sit down and read a book. So it's something that is subtle, but, but it's there. In the best cases, it's actually antidepressant. So, but that is what PEA does. PEA has, di- has been documented in the scientific literature uh, to actually, at times, reverse depression. And it is deficient uh, in people, uh, in children, it's ADD. Uh, and in, in parents, it's depression. So the same, the same mechanism, if you want, in the brain has been documented at both. So it's not so much as a high as much as just like a little bit of a, a feel good mental, mental energy. Aside from that, in the effect on stem cells, you have the same kind of benefits that you have with spirulina, which is a good source of protein, a good source of chlorophyll, a good source of polyunsaturated fatty acid, uh, contains a lot of the vitamins and minerals that the body needs, that kind of thing. Now, so do you recommend people that are taking spirulina to switch over to this, or is it only for certain use cases? I would not say to switch. You can take both. But the benefits that we get with AFA, or at least those that are unique to AFA, then I would say for that, then make sure you just add AFA to your to your diet. But AFA is not the only plant. So and that's pretty much the next 20 years of research is that now we have documented a number of plants. They're different. They don't bring the same thing, but on stem cell mobilization, they do have a similar effect if not sometimes stronger. Wow, wow. Can you can you go over some of those other plants? So we are in 2001, we discovered that uh, AFA act as a stem cell mobilizer, so putting more stem cells in circulation. So the first response from the scientific community is this is nonsense because your stem cells are only precursors to blood cells. So 20 years ago, that was the the dogma. So then we discovered and and the knowledge really developed that stem cells can become um, almost anything in the body. But, But back in 2001, we had to prove the mechanism of action. We had to show the active compound. We have to show proof of concept that it's indeed going to stimulate tissue repair. Once all of this was done, it was clear to me that we evolved in symbiosis with the environment. It cannot be that there's only one plant having an effect on stem cells. So to find the other, you just ask the same question, which was the problem face that, that I was facing with AFA, meaning a plant uh, bring many kinds of different uh, types of health benefits. So I looked at what else has been known to be associated with a lot of, of, of benefits. Think adaptogens, those plants that bring a lot of goods to the body, but we don't really understand what is their mechanism of action. So, so we studied medicinal mushroom, goji berry, like a lot of these plants. And the big uh, aha moment or the eureka is when I started to extend this kind of investigation to remote areas of the world, like on the Tibetan plateau, where they use local plants. What is their go-to plants? And we found sea buckthorn berry uh, and an extract from sea buckthorn berry that triggers stem cell release from the bone marrow. We have aloe macroclada. So in Madagascar, they have 60 species of aloe, but there's only one that they have used for century for a product that, that, that they call vahona. And they use it for all kinds of health issues uh, and for older men to continue to be able to work in the field until, you know, their 90s. So they use that product. So we derived our own extract of this aloe called aloe macroclada. And so far, that's the strongest response that we have documented. So I have a handful of plants that we have documented act as stem cell mobilizer, which means stem cell releasers. Now, did you say that you were able to take all these plants and put them together into one product? Correct. Or just... This is Stem Regen. So that's the product that I've developed maybe, what, six, seven years ago now. Uh, and it was for a number of years, like five years, it was in development with uh, different doctors and clinic to really ver- verify the effect. Uh, but essentially, it is the top five plants that we have documented over the years that act as stem cell mobilizers. So you take two capsules of stem regen and then you will put within about two, three hours an additional 10 million stem cells in circulation. Uh, And that's conservatively, but let's say 10 million additional stem cells in circulation. And when you start to think about the impact of this, like do this, let's say once a day for a month, that means you have released 300 million of your own stem cells. It starts to be over time extremely significant for, for the body's ability to repair.
Stem cells is a gray area in this country. And you've come up with a way for your body to create its own stem cells, which I guess was probably the best type of stem cell, right? That you'd want. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, what we need to understand in this whole concept is that when stem cells were discovered, you know, you started to, about, to talk about the cloning of a sheep, uh, which I think was somewhere in, in the early eighties, but, but they did this like with mice, they did this with dogs, they did this with various types of animals. And, uh, and, and the thing is that, and you do this by isolating an embryonic stem cell, which is a cell extracted from the very, very early embryos, let's say uh, eight, to eight to 10 days old embryo, and that cell can create an entire organism. So by cloning these embryonic stem cells, you could then clone uh, different organisms, like different, uh, like many sheep that is exactly the same sheep. So they did that with dog, mice, and sheep but they had never been able to grow human embryonic stem cells. So as long as you do this with mice and sheep and dogs, it's interesting science. It doesn't mean anything for human health. So the real explosion of what we know today as stem cell research uh, really came uh, through the discovery of a new means of being able to grow human embryonic stem cells. And, uh, and that was the start of, of everything. So, so, from that, the discovery is that we have stem cells in our, in our body, in our bone marrow. They are our repair system. We release them all the time. Anytime you've had an injury since the day you're born, there's a system, a process by which you release your own stem cells. They are guided to migrate. Where is the damage? They're called to migrate in that area and they essentially do tissue repair. So what we're doing with these plants is simply uh, enhancing, boosting this natural phenomenon that is happening all the time. So my suspicion or my understanding, let's put it this way, in the whole historical development of stem cell research is that when it was discovered that adult stem cells extracted from the bone marrow, from fat tissue, from your blood, can really become cells of the heart and the, and the lung and different tissues in the body, then the idea is how can we tap into the power of our stem cells? So the first the first inclination is to go and isolate them, take them out and put them back in where we want them. And as we do all this work over the years, we discover, well, your body does it anyway. Your body already releases them. They already go where they're needed. There's no difference between the stem cells that you injected in a vein or one that you release from your bone marrow. They're the same thing. So I would venture to say that had we known earlier on that you can release your own stem cells and they do the same thing as any stem cells that are injected. Maybe we would not have all the, the development now in stem cell injections that we see today. Can you tell me like, you know, what you're seeing in, in true world studies or real cases when you're combining, you know, stem cell uh, or stem regen with, you know, systems like this where you're getting injections of, of uh, umbilical cord stem cells? Well, we have right now a lot of use in um, surgery and also in uh, cosmetics, like any kind of procedure here to wrinkle removal for exosomes. And then you use stem regen, which is going to put more stem cells in circulation. You then give more leverage to the treatment. So when you inject things in the face in this way, what you've injected will stimulate the stem cells of that tissue and will also cause stem cells from the circulation to migrate into the skin. So by coupling these two approaches, adding stem regen to it, people typically will report uh, better results. In surgery, something similar, oftentimes people will isolate stem cells or PRP and lay it out in the wounds. Uh, but these uh, this PRP containing growth factors and V cells will also call for stem cells from the circulation. So as you put more stem cells in circulation, there's a synergy between these two, these two approaches. But where I have more data uh, is in a study that we've started about a year ago. It, it is ongoing, so we can publish when we have all the data. I'm working on a preliminary uh, publication right now because we've got 10 patients in each group, but it's on congestive heart failure. So we take people with stable, chronic congestive heart failure, which means more than two years in a condition where uh, with all the typical treatments for stable congestive heart failure, beta blockers, high blood pressure medication, diuretic, that kind of thing. They are at a stable condition with heart failure. So we take these individuals and then we separated them in three groups. One group is stem regen. One group is 
adipose stem cell injection and the other group is a combination of both. And just with stem regen, what we have so far, after six months, taking two capsules three times a day, everyone in the study has normalized cardiac function. So just alone, the product shows that your body has the ability to repair if you simply give it a chance by putting more stem cells in circulation. If you couple it with stem cell injection, you get about 40% improvement in ejection fraction. If you just do stem cells, you're at about 28% improvement in ejection fraction. So you can see that the stem regen is good enough Stem cell injection seems to be a little bit better. Both together gives you double impact. Oh, well, first of all, can you uh, define PRP, please? PRP, platelet-rich plasma or platelet-rich fraction. You take a blood sample, you spin it, and you will have your red blood cells at the bottom. You'll have your lymphocytes at the top. And somewhere in between those two, there's a layer which is mo your platelets. So they are the smallest cells in your blood, aside from your your uh, your erythro erythrocyte red blood cells. and uh, And... It's been known that if you suck that 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 fraction, uh, that plasma that contains the platelets, then it's extremely regenerative. It's been known in sports medicine for a long time, uh, horses, race horses. It's, it's been known for a long time. What was not known for a long time, and it's, that's a science that's probably, let's say, 15 years old right now, is that there is in human blood, in the human bone marrow, also in human muscles, in the human adult, there is a type of stem cells called V-cells, very small embryonic-like stem cells. They've also known as blastomere-like stem cells. So embryonic-like, blastomere-like, that means they have the pluripotency of what you normally find in an embryonic stem cells. They are the most potent stem cells in the human body, and they're very small. They're about the size of a platelet. So when you extract this platelet fraction, it contains growth factors, but it also contains those V cells. So that's what PRP is. I call it like the poor man stem cell, right? There you go. Um, <laughs> so to put it in layman's terms, you extract my blood, you spin it, you put it in a centrifuge. Now you, you have these, um, this PRP and then you re-inject it, right? Is, yeah. that, is that the process? Um, that's the process. If so if it's already in our body, then why go through this whole process? I, you know, it sounds counterintuitive. Can, can you elaborate on that? Is it not? To me, that's the big question of all. Why do we take something that is in the body, take it out, put it back in, and that has become a thing? And, um, and it's, I, I, I would say the only solid answer that I can give you is that oftentimes these treatments are done to take them from your overall blood circulation and you go and you inject them into specific areas like in the skin or in a joint or, or at the entrance of an organ. These have been the greatest uh, applications of something like PRP. When you talk about stem cell injection, the gist of it is that you take a, let's say, adipose stem cells, fat tissue stem cells. Your fat tissue contains a lot of these stem cells. So when you extract uh, stem cells from fat tissue and then put them back in the circulation, as a 50-year-old adult, you probably have something around maybe 10 to 12 million stem cells in your blood circulation. So when you do inject 100 million of these stem cells, the real contribution, although they were in your body to begin with, you just suddenly put way more in circulation. So it's more stem cells available to migrate into tissues. One stem cells can become 5,000 tissue cells. So suddenly you've given a boost of regeneration to various organs and tissue. Uh, this being said, they need to be able to, to reach all these tissues, migrate in these tissues, do their job. So it's not like that straightforward, but, but, but generally speaking, that's what is being done. Can we live forever? Are we living longer or is it just higher quality living? I would say it's the latter. It is really more quality living. Stem cells has provided us with, I believe, a completely new understanding of aging and disease formation. And it's the fact that we have evolved over tens of thousands of years with a life expectancy of 30 years of age. Longevity has never been selected in our evolution. And this is so well reflected by the fact that we're born with red marrow that makes stem cells and red marrow converts into yellow marrow that does not make stem cells. And that conversion is very fast in our lives. By age 30, we have lost about 90% of our red marrow, which means a 90% decline in number of stem cells in circulation. Now keep that in mind because the other part that has been discovered is that while stem cells play a key role in repair, 
They also keep playing a role in maintenance, tissue maintenance, meaning stem cell research has shown that every organ in tissue is constantly in the process of tissue turnover. You lose cells every day, they're replaced by stem cells. As long as you have enough stem cells to offset cellular loss, you maintain balance and your organs are working completely fine. But if by age 30, you've lost 90% of your stem cells, there's a point in your 30s where you lose that balance and you start to accumulate a daily deficit in the number of stem cells. So what we're talking about here is that the red marrow that you're left with at any age, whatever the age you are, that red marrow stays very constant. It just shrinks in, in volume, but it stays constant. If you help it put more stem cells in circulation, you put back in your blood circulation the number of stem cells that you had maybe 10, 15 years ago as you were earlier on in that whole decline. So now it's that many more stem cells that your tissues have to do repair and maintenance, meaning you lose your health as you age because you don't have enough stem cells to do the day-to-day -day repair and maintenance. By putting more stem cells in circulation, you just allow your body to have more organ function. But there's a point where this decline in stem cells reaches, you know, keeps moving forward. So you still, you still lose your life. So my point is that I believe that during your lifespan, which may increase a little bit, the best outcome uh, or the best result that we get is that you'll have a better health span during that lifespan. We all want to live forever and live longer, but you know, I think we're living longer, but the quality of life isn't there. Correct. So now if we, because you know, you said something interesting to me, you're losing these stem cells after the age of 30. That's when I like felt like I started to age a little bit, right? Like, cause you look at people at under 30 and you're just like growing, you know, whatever that is, you know, gray hair starts coming in at 30, things like that. Right. And, you know, but you said another thing that was really interesting to me is that, you know, you take two people the same age, they, oh, somebody has COPD, right? Which let's just assume for this argument, they're smoking and the other person, it doesn't. So in this situation, what's causing this? Anytime we summarize health or disease by one process in the body, I think we make a mistake. It, it, it's never one thing. It, it's many things that all stack together and that will define why things are so idiosyncratic with people. There's so many things about health that makes a lot of sense, well demonstrated, and yet you will get the centenarians that has been smoking in his entire life and drinking, you know, a, a few glasses of whiskey every day, and he's a hundred years old. So if, if everything we, 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 think about or talk about in terms of smoking and drinking, he should have died earlier. So somewhere there are things that, that we understand and are real, but they manifest themselves in different ways with different people. And I think it's a summary of our genetics, our past injuries, our uh, exposure to environmental toxins, I think our state of mind, our lifestyle. So there are many, many, many factors. But if we take to the example that you just, uh, that you just uh, proposed, um, Cigarette smoking, like alcohol, excessive alcohol, have been shown to suppress the ability of stem cells to migrate in a tissue and to multiply. So you damage your lung with tar, with, you know, all these chemicals that are in a cigarette. And as you damage your, your lungs, you also suppress their ability to repair. But now the question is, what if you start with somebody who naturally innately has more stem cells in circulation than somebody else. And although he's smoking, he can have more repair because he naturally has more stem cells in circulation. Let's say you get somebody that has better blood circulation so that these stem cells have better access to the microvasculature, where it's the only place where they can do their work. So, so suddenly you can have somebody with elements in their life that you would say are really bad, but it's compensated by things that are like fundamental for health microcirculation and more stem cells in circulation. Are we able to do actual repair and reversal of this damage with stem regen or stem cell therapy? Absolutely. I think that if, if, I'm, if I'm frank and honest and direct here, I think that the biggest obstacle to stem cell development in America, in Europe, the reason why you have to go to Costa Rica or Colombia to get these kinds of injection it's because in the first time in our history, we have something that is curative. Our entire pharma model in the West 
is based on palliative. You get diabetes, I'm selling you insulin every month for the rest of your life. I mean, this is an amazing business model. And suddenly something comes that is curative. It can actually repair your, your diabetes, your pancreas. These studies are done. They're published. It's like undeniable. Stem cells can repair to a point where you no longer need your insulin. It is one of the biggest threat to what we call, what I would call like the medical, the, 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 the corporate medical system that we have. And so barriers have been put, obstacles have been put to prevent the, the proper development of that science, which put aside or include all the risks, all the, the, the unknowns that still need to be studied, still needs to be determined. Let's not put that aside. Let's all keep those. It remains probably the greatest development in, our, in, in the history of medicine after probably penicillin. Inflammation and chronic illness, right? You mentioned it in the beginning of the interview. What's going on with this? Why do you think we keep seeing it? Why is it everywhere? And, and I feel like it's, it's, it's almost at the, the foundation of where most, of, most people's problems are coming from. Absolutely. Keep in mind that inflammation is something that is essential for survival. It is part of the healing process. The moment that you have an injury, the, the two things that are immediately of concern for the body, I mean, as a biological entity, is that did I have a breach and there's a bacteria in there and that bacteria, if it's not dealt with, can lead to systemic infection and it's, it's lethal. So, I, I'm, so I'm releasing compounds that are going to increase the flow, the blood flow in that area to rush the immune system to go and deal with that situation if there's a bacteria. At the same time, it releases compounds that will bring stem cells because if I have an opening and a wound, that wound, I need to close it as fast as possible. And to do this, I need repairs, I need stem cells. So I'm releasing compounds that will go and trigger the release of stem cells from the bone marrow. When stem cells get into a, a, a tissue, uh, sorry, a wound, it will first suppress inflammation, suppress the immune response, because right now we're, we're over the immune response. Now we need to repair. And, and that is the natural process. So you look at a kid, a kid does not have inflammation. It's, it's a rare, rare phenomenon. You get an injury, it repairs, it's gone, it's over. Inflammation as a cause of disease formation and aging is when, and keep in mind, our biology was not designed to live more than 30 years. By design, I mean there was never an evolutionary force to say we need to stay healthy for longer. It was just not there. So it was not selected. And now we've added 50 years to our longevity. The, and that's when inflammation becomes a problem. Before that, it's not really a problem. So I think the issue is that the, the decline in the number of stem cells in circulation makes it so that small injuries don't repair as well as they used to. So now you start to develop many foci of microinflammation that, that, that spread that inflammation that, which becomes systemic and inflammation has a lot of negative repercussions, uh, for many, many different aspects of, of human health. We can dive into it, but I think the only reason why inflammation is such a cause of problem is just because it's supposed to be a short term look localized phenomenon. And because of our declined ability to repair with age, it has slowly become a multi foci phenomenon that does not stop and become systemic. I'm starting to see that like my friend's children are having, you know, eczema, right? And other other issues, wh whether it's asthma or psoriasis or what, whatever types of, of ailments we're talking about at a very young age. And then I think that's where that chronic, you know, illness or chronic inflammation comes into play. What's going on there? There's a phenomenon that is real. And it's the fact that if I take a blood sample of just about anybody today, you will find roughly an average of about 300 compounds that did not exist in our grandfather's blood. The amount of plastic that you now find in the body, micro particle of plastic, because they're everywhere. Um, so I think that there's a lot of things in the body right now that biologically, the body was not designed to be able to eliminate these compounds, but they're there. 
and some of them are inert. And I think many of them are, are, are not inert. You know, they have some sort of, of biolo biological effect, which oftentimes is, is negative effect. The skin, we have to keep in mind, it is the largest organ of elimination. Uh, you primarily eliminate through your kidneys, through your liver, but you also eliminate quite a bit through your skin. Just have a meal with a lot of onions and garlic and see what your skin smells like. If you are exposed to some of these xenobiotics, even as a child, and for you, your skin is your main element of elimination, then yeah, you could, you could have a lot of these kinds of reactions in the skin. With somebody like me, I, I have about five or six autoimmune disorders, right? And you know, I started at six months old with, with asthma. By the time I was 18 years old, I had ulcerative colitis. Then from there, I had uh, psoriasis. Then by the time I was 30, I had psoriatic arthritis, right? I was in a wheelchair for a period of time because I had so much inflammation in my knees and my hips. And like, you know, I was getting my, my legs drained constantly, you know, and I didn't understand what was going on. And, you know, right away, what happens? Here's some methotrexate. Here's a uh, pregnisone. Here's embryol. Right. Let, you know, and we don't have to break down all that stuff. And, you know, I got to a point where I said to myself, wow, you know, and like I said, you had 30s when I really started to fall apart. I said, this is crazy. What's the next 50 years of my life going to be? 20 years ago, when, when I was in this position, this information was not readily available. Can, can, can stem cell therapy help with these types of issues? The intestinal flora in the, in the gut is to a large extent the culprit of a lot of autoimmune problems. This being said, Anything that is autoimmune or more generally speaking, degenerative. So let me answer your question about psoriasis with something for which I have a little bit more information, but I think it's the same phenomenon. Let's take ulcerative colitis or Crohn's or those kinds of, of conditions. When you have a, an acute phase where you bleed, you have cramps, you have pain, that acute phase is because there's an area of damage that cannot repair. The reason it cannot repair is because in an attempt to repair for long periods of time, it has exhausted its stem cell layer locally. Without that stem cell layer, the tissue cannot repair. And now you have the acute phase. If you put stem cells in circulation, stem cells will migrate where there is tissue damage. That's how they're designed. They're attracted to that. The area will release compounds and will attract stem cells to that area. That's how the system is designed. So they find these areas, migrate in that tissue, repopulate the stem cell layer, and now that area has regained the ability to repair. So, but you have not solved the problem. You've just patched the problem. You've increased quality of life for the time that you put more stem cells in circulation. So I think the analogy here is that Whenever a tissue is damaged somewhere and cannot properly repair, oftentimes it has locally exhausted its ability to repair. So putting stem cells in circulation may not necessarily take care of the problem, but it, it can take care of the expression of the problem while you dig deeper and try to find really what's, what's the cause. So yes, it can bring benefits. And at times it is, it is a benefit more as a balance. You have a, an ongoing degeneration. Well, if you increase the repair to, to be bigger than, than the degeneration, well, you reach functionality for as long as you maintain that balance. It's great that it can give that type of relief. So I'm in 2001, 2002. We have developed this concept that stem cells are the repair system of the body, something completely not present in, in the medical literature at the time. And the reason is that I'm thinking I have this plant here that seems like it's looking like a stem cell mobilizer. We documented that it does release stem cells. So I have something that releases stem cells. I have this concept that stem cells are the repair system of the body. I'm thinking if this is real, then we're really onto something. Uh, so I shipped uh, a number of bottles, maybe like 200 bottles to a friend of mine in France. Uh, and he was having a clinic where he was getting the kind of patients that uh, showed up at his place to say, my doctor told me there's nothing else they could do for me. And uh, so here's where I am. Uh, like, like many times, you know, when you go to alternatives, it's because you've exhausted the mainstream uh, medical paths. So he took these people and just shared the product with them. And I got back results that were just absolutely amazing. And in these cases, what this was this four-year-old girl with spinal myopathy. 
It was a genetic disease. Uh, she had two ants completely paralyzed in a wheelchair and she had never walked. She had never stood up on her own. And the doctor told the mother that the, do that, that the girl would simply go down from where she was at the time. So she was not walking. She was crawling some on the floor. Uh, she told, she asked me, can I give this product to my daughter? And I told her, well, you'll release stem cells with the same genetic defects. So it's not going to help. Uh, she said, can I still give it to my daughter? You know, it's free country. <laughs> if you want to give it to your daughter, it's fine. So she gave the product to her daughter. And three weeks later, I get an email for the first time, her daughter stood up. And then three weeks later, she started to walk. And then two months later, she was in school with the kids. And the only way that I could explain what was happening there, we have not changed anything to the genetic defect. We're releasing stem cells that have the same problem. We haven't changed anything. The only way to explain it is that these nerve cells with that genetic defect will degenerate much, much faster than in a normal person. But if I can repair faster than I de degenerate, then I maintain some functionality. That's a tremendous story. How is she doing now? And did they ever find the root cause? It's fascinating what happened because, uh, honestly, Alexander, I'll share something with you that even, even me talking about it, it's hard to wrap my mind around about it, but, but I've seen it a number of times. I'll share with you two cases. So that case, for example, uh, so the product at the time was an extract of this blue green algae. So as an extract, uh, the yield is much less than the raw plant. So the product was more expensive. So she tried it. It worked. And at some point, somebody told her, why do you pay that much for that product? You can get it much cheaper at this other place. But it was not the extract. So she started to take the other product and then her daughter started to regress. And then she called us back and she said that your product does not work. She has regressed. And I told her, well, it's not the same product. But in her mind, it was a marketing ploy. They were the same product. So she concluded the product actually did not work. So she doesn't understand why her daughter walked. I mean, try to wrap your mind around this. So, so I, then I lost contact. So I don't know where she is right now. Uh, and we've had other, other cases like this. Like we were working with a quadriplegics, uh, in, 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 Flor in a, sorry, in Hawaii. Uh, this is probably 15 years ago now. And uh, this quadriplegic with no mobility below the waist, below maybe mid mid thoracic, he had some movement with his arm, but that was it. Uh, after about four or five months, he started to have movement in his leg. About 10 months later, uh, he called us and he says, come and see what I can do in my bed. So he's, he's in his bed and he starts to contract all of his muscles, but it's regeneration of the spinal cord. So the nerve don't all connect one to one. So he, he needs physical therapy. but but as he's trying to contract his muscles, he's contracting flexor and extensor muscle at the same time. So he looks like he has almost like epileptic seizure. And it's not like full contraction, you know, it's, he's just, but you can tell now he has contraction in his abdominal muscle, back muscle, leg muscle. So there's mobility. And, um, he was all happy. And then about a month or two later, he called and he said he wanted to drop from the study. Uh, and, and I could not understand why. And the reason was that everybody in his family was excited that this father with young kids uh, that dove in a pool and broke his neck, uh, basically that father could regain mobility and could regain a normal life. That's how his family started to see this improvement. But for him, the improvement was so small. Yes, he can contract a few muscle in his bed, but he still completely need assistance for living. He has no mobility. He's still in a wheelchair. And he saw where he was and where everybody around him was seeing where he could go. And the distance was so big for him that he became depressed. And he fell into a depression and he didn't want to, to he didn't want to, to touch the product anymore. I've, I've, I've come to learn that human nature is not as simple as we think when it comes to just a, like a disease is wrapped up or a problem is wrapped up into a lot of, of mind stuff. Let's put it that way. You know, at the end of the day, I think you're right. You know, um, mindset is huge, right? And I, and I think both ways, you know, I had, I had a friend as well. He was 16 years old. He dove in a pool, became paralyzed. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. He lasted till about 30 years old. Um, which I think is, you know, 
when your body's sitting for so many years, it does deteriorate. Mm. You know, again, it, it is a it is a tough thing to go in and then and come out. And then, you know, you ask yourself if you take these pills over and over again, you go to physical therapy, am I gonna be walking and running again? Maybe, maybe not, you know, and then you know, maybe, you know, at that point, it's it's just too much to bear. So it, it, it can be tough. When you started the interview, you know, you mentioned um, epileptic seizures, you, you know, memory and stuff. Now, you didn't mention like Alzheimer's or dementia or whatnot. But um, do you want to talk a little bit about about that and and how, uh, you know, stem cell uh, regeneration is, is helping there? This was probably 2002, 2003. Uh, we just have so this AFA extract that puts more stem cells in circulation. And then the idea started to emerge in my mind that, that I bet that there's a link between disease development and the number of stem cells in circulation. So it was before publishing this idea in 2013 and all of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking here that, that probably people who develop degenerative disease have fewer stem cells in circulation. And we have, we had access in the local hospital to Alzheimer's patients. So about 200 of them. And uh, so I thought it would be a great population to test this idea. And what we discover in that condition is that they were not having fewer stem cells in circulation. They at times had more stem cells in circulation, those that were more advanced with Alzheimer's. However, what we found is that there was a direct link between systemic inflammation and the development of Alzheimer's and the stem cells that were in the blood had been affected by that systemic inflammation and they had lost the, the molecule, the protein present on their surface that is necessary for their migration in tissues and in the brain. So they, so it's almost like the brain is asking for repair. The bone marrow is releasing stem cells, but the overall terrain cannot utilize these stem cells for repair. And, and the same thing with dementia. We have had people who reported benefits, but I won't say it's one of the conditions on which we we have a lot of benefits. So my suspicion here would be to say that stem cells can help, but there's something deeper with the overall terrain that needs to be taken care of, and it's probably not yet fully understood. Yeah, it's interesting to share because, like you said, maybe there's something that's blocking it from getting there. Um, I read a study recently where there's a theory that sugar is is causing this, right? And because mm -hmm. at the turn of the century, not this turn, the previous one, um, you know, obviously sugar became more available, and that's when you know um, dementia started to really you know take off. Um, and you know, correlation, cor causation, you know, you know that saying. Um, who knows? But again, it's interesting to see um, that you know, again, you're being honest with this stuff. It's not a fix all. But, you know, there are some way, pl places that it really helps. Uh, another thing that's been coming up often is, is hydrogen. You know, one doctor I mm -hmm. spoke to said that, you know, it's the most important element in the world. And, you know, it's, it's the smallest element on the periodic table. It passes a blood-brain barrier. Um, is there anything you can say on it or discuss about it, being that, that you're uh, a scientist? I mean, it's almost like a statement of the obvious, you know. We, we define organic matter as carbon base. You know, it's, it's everything in your body is carbon based, sugar, protein, everything. Uh, carbon is life, but carbon alone is not life. It's charcoal. So it's carbon associated with oxygen and hydrogen. So everything in life is oxygen, hydrogen attached to carbon and every single chemical reaction in the body almost always involves the movement of hydrogen atom in a, in, a, in, a, in a reaction of reduction or oxidation. So hydrogen is at the center of everything, and, uh, and it is the universal antioxidant. It is, you take the, 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 the harshest uh, free radicals, which is the hydroxyl, you know, OH, hydroxyl group, and you combine it with hydrogen and you get water. You've neutralized it and you've created what is the source of life in a way. So hydrogen is definitely, you know, uh, one of the most important molecule for life. The question is, and, and I agree with it in the sense that I, I use, I drink hydrogen water. So I, I like the whole concept, but it's everywhere in nature. It's in your food. It's everywhere. It's part of everything. Is there any, you know, practical advice you can give or you know, any type of protocols or, you know, like everyone loves a list of like, do this, this, and this kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, and whether that includes, you know, stem regen in this protocol or just, you know, some life, life lessons that you learn that you do every day. 
um, that you find, you know, make you younger, feel better, wh whatever it is. Do you have anything you want to share? I've been so deep in stem cells for the past 20 years that I looked at almost everything from that angle. And I don't want to say it is the be all and all of, of health. Uh, mitochondrial function is essential. Uh, there are many, many aspects. You need to have the proper uh, fatty acid balance in the body. Many, many things are extremely relevant for health. But at the end of ev when everything is said and done, if you have a cold, you boost your immune system. When you have something, something that is damaged and needs repair, there's only one thing that will make that repair is your stem cells. Now you can do other things to support stem cells. There's a lot of things that are known to boost the body's ability to repair, but they're going to do it. They cannot do it in any other way than by leveraging the building blocks of repair in your body, which is your stem cells. So for me, stem cells is at the core of any strategy that aims at repairing something or enhancing the effect, uh, the, the, the performance of an organ or a tissue. So if I answer your question by saying, let's dive at the core of what is human health and health maintenance. What is the health system of the body is your stem cells. So let's do everything we can to support stem cell function. So first, you release stem cells from the bone marrow with a product like Stem Regen. There's a direct link between how many stem cells you have in circulation and the body's ability to repair. I can drown you in studies and science backing up that statement. We rarely talk, talk about this in popular medical science. You can have the great, the greatest blood test that you want with all the right ratios of, of nutrients and cells and everything. If the, if the blood cannot freely and effectively circulate in your micro vessels, your capillaries, then what's the deal? Like you don't have, it's like you having a bank account, having a, 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 a pile of money in your bank account, but you don't have the instrument to be able to withdraw that money. So it doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank account. So microcirculation. So and microcirculation means good blood fluidity. So things like natokinase, enzymes that will digest fibrin in the blood, nidokinase, serapeptase, lombrokinase. These are all enzymes that are very well known in the marketplace to improve blood fluidity. You want to dilate your capillaries. So nitric oxide, it is the natural compound that your body will, will produce in order to increase the size of capillaries. You also want to, uh, to maintain the, a good uh, glycocalyx. That is one part that is Again, very, very rarely talked about. And the next thing that you want to do is you want to suppress systemic inflammation. Remember that study with Alzheimer's. When there is systemic inflammation, you suppress stem cells' ability to identify where there's a problem and go there. So release stem cells, suppress systemic inflammation, boost your microcirculation. You've already done like something very impressive here that your body will gain benefit from, I would say, 100% of the time. Well, that's a powerful protocol. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, on a couple of final notes, where can we find you? I have a book called Cracking the Stem Cell Code. So the third edition was about a year ago, and I added a number of cases that we, that we developed over the years. So there's a chapter with some of these key cases, and I chose cases from people who had issues that normally in medicine, there's nothing that medicine can do. Things like stroke more than a year later after the stroke, whatever is left, kidney failure, uh, severe cardiomyopathy, uh, severe Parkinson's, spinal cord lesion. So I'm documenting cases uh, that, that we've had with these plant-based stem cell enhancers. So, But the, the, the book, the aim of cracking the stem cell code was to essentially answer two questions. If stem cells have such amazing regenerative potential, uh, and then people take them out of the body and they put them back in and they get, they get great results, then the question is, what is the role of stem cells in the body? Forget taking them out. What do they do naturally in the body? And if we can put more in circulation, what could be the impact of this on health? So all the science is existing on that is summarized into cracking the stem cell code. Uh, but from a product standpoint and from a, an update standpoint of discussing the science and all of that, this is on, uh, on, on my website, which is stemregen.co.
uh, stemregen.co, you can see the product. There's different parts, tabs where you can read more information. But the update on answering questions, sharing cases, bits and pieces of, of information on stem cells uh, and other plants, uh, it's stem cell Christian, either TikTok, Instagram. I put a lot of material there just answering questions. Great. Thank you. That was, uh, that was amazing. Um, anything else you want to add that we, we didn't cover? We have a repair system just like we have an immune system. The last time that a system was described the way that we understand our system, meaning cardiovascular system, nervous system, immune system, endocrine system, was in the, the early 1900s with the nervous system, endocrine system, and immune system as we know them today. A century later, we discover we have a repair system. It looks like an analogy. It looks like some sort of a metaphor, and it's not. Think of the immune system. Lymphoid tissue releasing specific cells called B cells, T cells, uh, natural killer cells that will go and be guided specifically to an area where you have an infection. When they arrive at the infection, they will do one specific thing. They will get close to a bacteria and will kill the bacteria. That's your immune system. Everybody accepts it. Nobody thinks twice about it. And now we have the bone marrow, a specific tissue making a specific cell, the stem cell, C34 cell. We can isolate it, identify it very well. That stem cell will be attracted specifically to an area of tissue damage to repair that damage. It is literally the repair system of the body. Once we understand that the body is a repair system, now go back to any problem that you may have and ask yourself, what is the best system to support in my body to help me get better with XYZ condition. Anything that you have that is degenerative always involves repair of the part that is not functioning properly. So I think when we look at it that way, it just puts stem cells just at the core of almost any program, any strategy we develop to either get better with our health or get, gain greater performance. So anyway, my message at the end is like, let that sink in. The body has a repair system. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you, having you on. Um, I hope you had as much fun as I did. Um, and I, I hope we can have you back to, to cover, you know, more fundamentals. Let's do it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you.